so hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Good afternoon. Um, as Annabelle already said, we are going to talk a bit about uh, climate controversies, the concept of climate controversies, why and how to map uh, conflict in discourses. So this presentation is very much based on uh, the kind of research that we do at the Center for Sustainable Development, and more in particular, the research that I and uh, Thomas, but also the people from the Centre d'études de développement durable from the Free University of Brussels have been doing uh, for the last year, um, which is mapping discourses within several of these uh, climate debates. Um, so a very short overview of what we will be doing. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll introduce the topic with a very concrete example. And then uh, my colleague Thomas will um, talk a bit about the theoretical foundation of the kind of research that we do, uh, the concept of climate controversies, a bit more background on that. Also, discourse analysis as some kind of approach to understanding social reality, to uh, social scientific research, uh, also be introduced. And then I'll take the word again and I'll talk a bit about the study that we've been doing for the Koning Bodwin Stichting, uh, how this discourse analysis plays out in practice in a very concrete example of such as climate controversy um, in Belgium. And then, of course, there's uh, some room for uh, Q&A as well. Um, so we start with a concrete example. And um, I thought it was best to start with a, a question, namely, is frequent air travel still OK uh, in light of uh, climate change? Um, so this can be quite a straightforward question. It's just one line. Um, people can talk about this in a bar or whatever. Uh, but if you go and if you look at it from a societal perspective, you see that it becomes much more complex. And the question disentangles into a lot of sub-debates, into a lot of topics that can be covered and that can uh, create discussion among actors. For example, uh, to the top of the right, um, an image of the European Commission, which basically states that aviation is important for uh, job creation, for economic growth. One direct job. Uh, and aviation creates three additional jobs up the value chain for tourism, for logistics, uh, for retail. So um, the idea might be here that despite sustainability challenges, despite climate change, um, aviation is something good. It's a socio-economical motor for uh, economic development. It's also something for uh, social cultural exchange. So this might be something that comes into the debate. Others might say on this level, um, societal level that um, the, the continuous economic growth of aviation might not be compatible with climate change. We, should, we have to go to some kind of um, scenario where we uh, tax uh, aviation more. We create some kind of economic level playing field between aviation on the one hand and more sustainable forms of travel, like, for example, train travel on the other hand, or should we maybe go to a scenario of aviation degrowth altogether? Um, and what would that look like? And which actors should have a say in this? What is degrowth in this context of aviation? Um, and then also there is this element of, of individual behavior, of course. Um, so frequent air travel is still okay in light of climate change. Can we still, as tourists or as business people uh, back in the day when we were allowed to fly and go somewhere. Uh, can we still do this in the future? Um, can we do this, for example, with uh, companies in Belgium like Green Tripper who uh, provide us with CO2 compensation schemes that we can then use? And is this then a more sustainable way of traveling? Can we, as the, the slogan of the company says, can we give back to nature what we take from it if we uh, fly a plane and can we do this uh, through CO2 emissions or should we go for uh, a more um, sustainable way of traveling by only using the train or the bike or like this uh, doing only online conferences and also the, 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 the behavior that we have on the ground as tourists um, there are some actors that say that we cannot just get rid of uh, tourism in faraway countries in the global south altogether because it's also much an important uh, motor for economic growth in these countries and important motor for local communities so do we have to take this into account as well so you see um, this is just an introductory example to say that what seems to be a, a quite a straightforward question uh, when you look at it from a societal level it disintegrates into many different sub questions and in many different positions by different actors in which they combine 
certain factual information and put it into a context of normative values, of values, things that they find important, namely, for example, economic growth or a strong sustainability uh, degrowth or the freedom to travel wherever you want or uh, the right of local communities in the global south to develop themselves to, uh, to tourism and to uh, getting money from this tourism. So it's much more complex and this is the basis of uh, these climate controversies, in which Thomas will now introduce you uh, in terms of theory. Hopefully this, this short presentation by Frederick already clarifies a little bit how we address within our research center a discourse analysis. And in a nutshell, it involves a kind of a mapping of a societal debate around a very specific controversy. And I also hope that this introduction, this, this illustration, this short illustration, that this helps to understand the theoretical background that I will explain now in, in the next 15 minutes. Um, yeah, as, as mentioned, I will start by explaining what we mean by climate controversies. And in all of you, controversies are related to wicked problems. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Frederick. Yeah, so as we, and, and we can best use the typology of Hisham, Muller and, and Hoppe to explain this. They have made a kind of typology of problems and based on the degree of certainty on the available knowledge and as the horizontal axis and the degree of agreement on norms and values and that's the vertical axis. And as opposed to the structured problems that's at the, at the bottom on the left, and you, can, you can think of, for instance, the problem of the ozone layer hole, as opposed to these structured problems, we see in the top right, the wicked problems such as uh, climate change issues. And these problems prove very difficult to solve because there is on the one hand uncertainty uh, and, and controversy uh, regarding the knowledge base. So there's discussion between scientists and on the other hand, there is also a disagreement on the values and norms related to, to problem definitions as well as uh, related to solutions. So there's also discussion um, among all kinds of societal actors. And it's clear that, that at this moment that uh, we are evolving from a situation uh, of certainty and, and predictability to, towards a situation with much more shared uncertainty. And so we need uh, to learn how to deal with this complexity, to deal with this wickedness. And, and we believe that uh, discourse analysis can help. And, uh, just because um, clear cut solutions for wicked problems, they, they do not always exist. We need to leave room for, or better, we, get, we need to get a clear view on different uh, scientific and normative perspective and positions uh, on the issue at stake. And, and we are not used to do that, uh, not at least because this requires, uh, amongst others, uh, this requires a quite modest attitude towards scientific facts. Especially uh, is this modest uh, attitude necessary when there is no robust knowledge and no robust scientific knowledge when this is not yet available and when the controversy is still uh, alive. Uh, of course, and you can go to the next slide, Frederick. Of course, we realize that this gives um, ammunition to anti-scientists and to spreaders of fake news. I think, for instance, of uh, climate change and ice like Donald Trump. And when, when knowledge does not fit well with their interests, uh, they start to sow doubt and they want to keep the controversy alive, uh, but in an artificial way, uh, often through uh, lobby groups. Uh, but we follow Bruno Latour, uh, who argues that when there is no more a controversy, then it's really wrong to feed uncertainty and denying that there is an increase in global carbon emissions as shown on this slide and Friedrich this the denying that there is that there is such an increase that it's not done after so many uh, IPCC reports and the point we want to make we want to make here is that there is an interest that it's interesting to acknowledge that um, multiple discourses are valuable but that we need to be very alert when a discourse is blind to scientifically robust knowledge, when they remain consciously blind because the knowledge does not fit their way of consuming and producing, for instance. But already good to know in our discourse analysis on, on um, climate controversies in Belgium, um, post-truth and fake news spreaders, they were not really at the forefront. Eh? But of course, uh, the controversy of about how to achieve the, the net of zero targets is still at stake. That, that's related to the, the downward line in pink red uh, on the slide. Uh, the controversies on these transition pathways 
are still very much alive. And if you go over these uh, controversies in a quite general way, then we notice that the climate discourses we unraveled during research, that these strongly align with some meta discourses on sustainable development. And maybe we can take a look at these. So in the search for sustainable development or in the debate on uh, sustainable development, we simply see um, three major interpretations, or we, as mentioned, we can also name them as meta discourses, meta discourses. So uh, following Hophout and his colleagues, we can distinguish uh, three interpretations ranging from status quo to, to transformation. And views in the status quo believe in business as usual. Right? So they believe that sustainability can be achieved within the existing political structures and economic growth models, right? such as trickle down economics, and the saving grace here is technological innovations. Reformist models are more critical of current policies of government and businesses, but they still believe that sustainability problems can be solved within these uh, structures. And so there is a focus on green economy and there is a strong role for, for a guiding and regulating government. And according to transformative approaches uh, within the transformation part, um, they say that a fundamental change is needed because sustainability problems are simply located within or dominant structures. And so there is often here in, in this transformation part, there's often a focus on more radical uh, strategies like degrowth, sufficiency, redistribution, and so on. Okay, I think we cannot simply judge which meta discourse is right and which is wrong. It always depends a lot of which scope we use on, on, on our norm, norms and values from which assumptions we want to start. So next slide, Frederick. So, and this slide makes clear that discourses, interpretations or technical scientific positions that, they, that these are always interwoven with with specific worldviews, interests, and normative beliefs. And so I think it's needless to say that discourse analysis fits in, in so-called constructivist approaches. The majority of, uh, of uh, discourse approaches is based on the assumption that reality is constructed, right? constructed through processes of social meaning making, uh, relying on, on the use of language. And in a constru constructivist view, there is no such a thing at least there is no such a thing when there is a controversy or a wicked problem. And there's no such a thing as a two world model in which on the one hand, we see neutral sciences and that address the problem. And on the other hand, we see um, politics and policies that make normative, uh, ideological informed choices. And so we are always dealing with strong linkages between facts, uh, technological preferences, interests, values, and so on to make or point even better, perhaps um, the pictures on the next slide can help. Um, so depending on the perspective and scope, uh, there are different truths. Uh, and this, there is no right or no uh, neutral position. Uh, we always bring certain assumptions and concerns to the forefront. And as such, uh, we remain blind to other elements. And so sometimes you are confronted with a rabbit and another time uh, with a duck. Uh, this is not a bad thing or not a problem. On, on the contrary, I think it helps to remain humble, to remain modest. But does this mean that we should consider all interpretations or all discourses as equally important? Of course not. We are not in favor of, of, of so-called anything goes relativism. We argue that precisely because knowledge on wicked problems such as climate change is always political, political, right? that therefore we need to engage politically with it. Right? Actually, it, it, it really opens the possibility to adopt a position, to adopt a specific discourse. And according to us, we are not neutral, of course, we argue for discourse that uh, thinks beyond uh, status quo approaches. So the importance of a, an open, strong and democratic debate is also addressed in the next part of this lecture in which we explain the why and how of discourse analysis. Yeah, okay. So maybe the advantage of, of waiting to explain uh, the basic concept of this lecture uh, that you will, will know, maybe you, you will have already a good understanding of the definition of discourse. Eh? So the authors we use, like uh, Martin Heyer and John Dreisig, they define uh, a discourse as a set of ideas and concept, concepts that certain 
actors produce and reproduce, and that this coherent whole is transformed in particular practices. And Dreisig is more or less on the same line, and he sees a, a discourse as a shared way of, of, of seeing and approaching the world. So within a discourse, a lot of information and knowledge is connected into coherent storylines. And our approach is to discourse analysis, try to map the different storylines, as well as the foundations of assumptions and the metaphors of all relevant discourses um, on the issue at stake. And as such, it, it's always a quantitative research in, in which two things are really important. And one is, is the interpretation of text, and texts, and two, their political context. So it's about text in context. Okay, and why is it interesting to, to, uh, to conduct a, a, a discourse analysis? And we see three main reasons. So first of all, we want to understand the controversy. We want to know who says what and why. So as mentioned on the slide, we must acknowledge that discourse analysis does not look for truth, but rather at who claims to have the truth. Second, we think that, that um, a discourse analysis helped to understand social change. So discourse, discourses are performative. They do something, they have influence. Uh, those who are able to dominate the societal debate with their discourse, they have power. And of course, power always depends on other factors as well, but a discourse analysis helps to understand how truths are produced, are reproduced through discourses. At least that's the focus uh, within Foucauldian, so-called Foucauldian discourse analysis, so approaches based on, on theories of Michel Foucault. And other approaches such as te text linguistics, uh, they focus much more on language and text structures and not uh, really on power or social cultural meaning structures. And third, we argue that a discourse analysis can really stimulate a democratic debate. And so a good analysis pays attention to all relevant points of view that shape the debate, including discourses that differ, differ from, the, um, from the dominant thinking. And, and th th there's this room for alternatives. So in a way, discourse um, analysis has the potential to highlight new and different discourses. And as such, researchers who conduct a discourse analysis, they intervene. Eh? They, during the research, they make choices, they split, they merge, they leave room for alternative views, and so on. But of course, discourse analysis is not just throw everything together. The, the, the discourse analysis has to be done in a in, in good scientific way. And, and we opt for a profound analysis of four issues per discourse. That's the next slide. So based, that's always based on a great amount of empirical material, which is obtained through gathering hundreds of documents and also through, through a lot of interviews. But I can go over this quickly, I think, because it's illustrated in the examples explained by Frederick. But it's very important to map the storyline of each discourse. What is the diagnosis? What are their strategies and solutions? These things are really at the forefront of the debate. And often these are translated into meaningful metaphors. And these can be slogans, but also cartoons or pictures. And at the same time, uh, we also want to look at the basics of the storyline, the so-called worldviews. Uh, what are the fundamental assumptions? What is seen as self-evident uh, within each discourse? And finally, it's also useful to consider um, which actors get which role, uh, who is active, who is passive, who is responsible for that, uh, what interest needs to be served, or whose interests uh, need to be served, and so on. So to conclude, theoretical part, uh, we would like to mention what a discourse analysis is not. Although we described the discourses always in, in a in so-called idle typical way, we want to avoid dualism. Eh? So no pro-contra narratives, uh, or no proponent, proponents versus opponents, uh, but the aim is always to be more nuanced. It's also not really a public opinion in the sense of how many people think this and how many think, uh, people think that. And it's also not a summary of an academic debate in peer review journals. And researchers who conduct discourse analysis should dive into the societal debate. And Friedrich, you can. And this debate also takes place in newspapers, uh, on televisions, on websites, in books and blogs, and so on. 
And it's also good to know that a discourse does not simply uh, present itself. Eh? Discourses are not just out there. Eh? Researchers have to search, they have uh, to deal with masses of data, they have to arrange and rearrange, construct, reconstruct, and so on. So uh, I have really great respect for uh, Friedrich, who did a lot of work in this uh, research pro uh, project of the King Baldwin Foundation, and uh, it's very well done. So Friedrich, you have the floor for a uh, next illustration. Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas, also for the kind words in the end. Um, so after a lot of theory uh, for an afternoon uh, online, so we are going to go into more uh, the meat of the exercise, which is based on, uh, why does my, ah, okay. So which is based on a study that we did, um, me, Thomas, but also our colleagues from the Centre d'Etudes de Développement Durable, from the Free University of Brussels, which was basically all the theoretical things that you just, that Thomas just uh, so eloquently explained, uh, we tried to put into practice on three climate controversies in Belgium. First one, is it still okay to fly, was already uh, very shortly uh, delved into in the introduction. Second one is on meat production, meat consumption, also something that has been around for a long time that also caused us a societal debates to uh, come up and then go away again or articles that are being written on this. And the third one was actually on a, a kind of a new issue that's coming up now in, in the European debate, but also in the Belgian debate is, is on hydrogen as uh, a so-called key for our sustainable future. So what can hydrogen do for industry? What can it do for our energy needs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for this uh, presentation, for this exercise, I opted to uh, go a bit deeper into the meat or no meat uh, controversy. And um, what Thomas already talked about uh, previously on this difference between uh, discourses that highlight uh, more like status quo, the business as usual, to discourses that are more transformative, we also find this here. Um, so first of all, the first discourse that's uh, based on our study uh, we identified was the so-called in Dutch lekker van bij ons uh, discourse, which is basically it meat is good and it's also local and uh, it's healthy, it's good for you. So the basic line of argumentation, this is the, the, the storylines that we talked about in the ethical framework. Um, it's, it starts from the idea that Belgian livestock farming is already to a large extent sustainable. It's already to a large extent uh, circular. Um, so on the one hand, this leads to uh, nuancing the efforts that still have to be made constantly. Uh, and on the other hand, it calls for a, a consumption of meat that's uh, local, first of all, that's moderate. And um, if we do this as consumers, this can be done sustainably, this can be done healthy, this can be done purely, and this can also be done like a high quality pro uh, product can be consumed. Um, what's also important here is that the debate that it's going on and all, all the critique that is being voiced uh, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the way that agriculture and uh, animal production is being done today. All the criticism that's out there is being seen as ideologically biased, it harms farmers, it deprives us of individual freedom. So it's a very defensive attitude in a way uh, we found uh, towards the debate. Um, so I, I've, I've used some the metaphors that we talked about here are also the idea of farmer's pride, Burentrots, which is a, a Flemish campaign of the Burenbond. So the idea that uh, farmers are yeah, basically providing us with the food that we all need, but they're also victims of climate change. They're also victims of this discourse that's more critical towards animal production. And also pretty interesting, interestingly, according to me, of course, is the idea of meat as being something pure, as being something local versus uh, vegetarian alternatives or vegan alternatives that are being seen as um, are produced and not really transparent in terms of what's in there. And it's also part of uh, major food companies, international food companies. So it's not uh, not good for you. It's not, not healthy. And it's also not very local or uh, good for uh, in terms of local value chains. So, and then if you break it down to the world views on the one hand and also the role conception that's in there on the other hand, we find that, first of all, in terms of world view, it's a, it's a soft sustainability here in the sense that um, the idea here is that the current model is already quite circular and quite sustainable. So this has two arguments, first of all, uh, in terms of, of uh, doing things, technological development, uh, becoming more sustainable. Belgian farming is already state of the art. 
But secondly, the model itself of final production is all also to a certain extent inherently circular already. Uh, what, what, it, what it says is that animal production uses residual flows from other kinds of agriculture, from uh, plant-based agriculture, and this can upcycle these, 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 these waste flows towards something that's better, mainly meats or dairy or something. So it's kind of an upcycling exercise in that sense. And every further sustainability initiative can be uh, achieved through technological innovation. The idea of sustainable intensification is strongly there in this course. Um, the idea that through um, technological development, we can produce more in a more sustainable way. And in this sense, the growth model that's there right now and the idea of sustainability and the long-term objectives by the European Union, but also in the Paris Agreement, both can be, um, yeah, can be intertwined and, and there's no contradiction between them. It's all also very market-based in a way because the argumentation also goes in our findings that um, any, any idea, any criticism that production should be uh, altered, maybe there should be less uh, animal production or maybe uh, there should be more stringent regulation which would cause more uh, expensive production. So any of these initiatives would, make sure, would uh, imply that production is being driven elsewhere. And if production is driven elsewhere, then it will of course uh, be out of our hands and perhaps it will be done also less sustainably. So there's some, some kind of inherent market-based truth there that is being presented as naturalistic. So there's not really any questioning about that. That is just like, if this happens, then that happens. Um, then in terms of role conception, we see that very strongly in this discourse that sector and consumers are seen as self-regulating. So the sector does everything it can. Consumers have to buy local products, especially since the corona crisis, uh, crisis we see that this idea of local consumption is, 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 is there uh, to a stronger degree than it was before. Um, farmers are being seen as, are always depicted as local. They are family-based. Um, and they are a victim of both climate change and also of uh, sustainability critiques for more strong uh, visions on this. So in a way, they are uh, a double victim of what is going on right now. So once again, quite a defensive attitude. And critical voices, any criticism is being seen as biased or uninformed. Uh, so they don't, they don't really know what they talk about. They are not farmers themselves. So they, they, they talk from an ideological uh, starting point instead of from knowing what's going on on the ground. Um, so a second discourse that we find is what I call uh, pragmatic and plant-based, which is uh, in a nutshell, a vegan discourse. Um, and the basic line of argumentation here is that um, there's a, of course a negative impact of animal production on animal welfare, on the environment, on climate and health. So this is pretty uh, easily linkable to a vegan uh, mindset, but mainly because of this first reason, namely animal wel welfare and the fact that it's morally wrong to produce for that to produce animals and to consume them, uh, a fully plant-based future is envisioned. And what I found interesting, especially, is that this is seen as to be achieved by stimulating a positive interaction between market supply and demand, and by technological innovation. So, in a way, it's also very market-based. It's also very much based on technology as a driver of uh, sustainability. So. Um, for people that are more into this debate, the idea of the protein transition is now becoming more and more important. I have the impression also in the Flemish debate, there's also a Flemish uh, the strategy from the Flemish government on this. Uh, also the idea of cultured meats, uh, growing meats, uh, cellular, cellular agriculture, so uh, beyond the classic uh, agricultural production that we know today. So once again here, a worldview is quite peculiar, but also quite interesting, I find, because it's it's fluctuates between a hard and a soft sustainability. Um, so the end point is, is quite uh, transformative, 100% plant-based future in the end. But the way to get there is very much within existing economic and social structures, in the sense that um, what needs to happen, what drives this transition towards a plant-based future forward is uh, seducing customers, seducing customers to uh, eat more vegan products, to eat more vegetarian products by giving them uh, cooking examples, by making sure that their initial, perhaps initial hesitance to eat these kinds of products goes away. And if we can do that, then there can be a positive feedback loop between supply and demand, because then private actors will also jump on this market, will produce more, and this creates uh, some kind of loop. So it's very 
Uh, it's very pragmatic, it's very market-based, and there's also a very strong belief in uh, technological innovation. Uh, once again, cellular and these kinds of things. Um, so we find that uh, in Flanders, uh, especially, but also in Malunia, um, this whole uh, philosophy of veganism and also this position vis-a-vis -vis meat is based on the idea of effective altruism, uh, Peter Singer, these kinds of thinkers in the past. So the idea of a rational and pragmatic pursuit of a fully vegan future, which is basically uh, these people start from, from uh, very strong values on animal production, on the fact that it's morally wrong to eat animals. But the way that they, they try to uh, sell these arguments uh, between brackets, they try to do this without uh, imposing this morality upon customers. So we don't want to make people feel guilty. We don't want to shame them into eating something else. No, we have to seduce them. We have to uh, make sure that they like what they eat. And in this sense, this is the most effective way to come to a fully vegan future. So it's a very, um, once again, very pragmatic discourse in that sense. In terms of role conception, also here we see that um, the limelight is mostly focused on the positive dynamic between producers and consumers. So if we can make sure that consumers buy more um, vegan stuff, if they buy more vegetarian products and producers will jump on this. This will cause other consumers to uh, jump on this project. And this is how we uh, go to a vegan future. Um, farmers and agriculture are there, but only marginally. So it's much more about how to sell products, but not so much about how to, uh, they don't really engage this, this discourse with uh, some of the debates that we see between agroecology, which is coming, and also um, the Lekker van bij ons discourse on, for example, how to deal with residual flows in agriculture. What can we do with these if, um, if meat production goes away? So these are types of questions that I didn't feel he, didn't really find answers on uh, for this study. And public actors, governments, etc., are mostly involved in this sense through soft policy. So they have to nudge, they have to invest in R&D for this cellular agriculture. And in this sense, uh, technological innovation and also consumer uptake can be increased. And then uh, a final discourse, the most transformative one is uh, agroecology. Um, so it's focused specifically on social carnage, uh, it's a bit of a strong word, but uh, maybe more in English, uh, the social carnage among farmers as a result of the current growth logic. And of course, once again, negative impact of intensive agriculture and meat production on climate, on people, on the environment, and also not only here, but also in the global south. So the value chains, uh, whereas the first discourse was very much local in a sense, uh, local farmers here, the value chains are seen as international. And what, what happens here if we eat meat here also has repercussions for, for example, Latin American countries, rainforests, these kinds of debates. So it puts forward in terms of the prognosis, it puts forward a very holistic vision of the agricultural transition. So it's not only about creating some, some kind of new agriculture that is in balance with nature, that is also intertwined with nature, the idea of land sharing, um, it also, it's also socio-political, the idea of food sovereignty, which is also in the, the image below. Food sovereignty, taking back control over the way in which our food is produced, not only as consumers, not only as us as civilians, but also uh, farmers have to take back some control in the value chain because they lost it to big food companies uh, and this has to be rectified in the future. And also scientific repercussions. So the idea of a farmer, not just as some kind of passive victim of what's going on, uh, of climate change, but also as a knowledge producer in, in science. So it has to, this, the farmer himself has to have a say in uh, the future of, agro, of uh, agriculture and also in the scientific research that's going on in this sense. So in terms of worldview, this is the most transformative discourse um, that we found. It's much more about reducing animal production. It's about rethinking value chains uh, for meat and food in general, and try to work towards a whole new uh, and local agricultural system embedded in nature. Um, so this much more than the other discourses is based on some kind of systems thinking. So the holistic vision is here once again, uh, not only ecological, but also social political, also scientific. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a very broad vision here. And it's also the, the discourse where social justice is uh, most present. So the current model is being seen as fundamentally unfair, uh, not only nationally, but also internationally. So we only, we need distributive justice, giving back 
some parts of the value chain to farmers, but also procedural, making sure that farmers and consumers have a say in what a transition is heading uh, in the near future. So here we see in terms of role, um, role conception, a central role for public actors, not only uh, on all levels from regional to European, and really steering the transition. So not just nudging, not just being somewhere on the sideline, but really uh, trying to steer a transition towards an agroecological future. Um, active role, once again, for producers and for consumers as well. So an idea of less, but also better meat as a new business model. And once again, a centrality of the farmer, a bit uh, like in the Lekker van Bayon's discourse, uh, the farmer is also being seen as a victim, but it's much more active in this sense. He has to regain ownership of the value chain and he has to become uh, involved in uh, knowledge production as well. So um, this was a very dense part. I apologize for all the, uh, all the talking on my part, but um, the, 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 the question still remains, what can we learn from this? Um, so we can map these discourses and Thomas also said about the theoretical background that, that informs this kind of analysis. But then the question is, okay, what, what can we do with this? What can we learn from this? Um, which is a hard question, I'll admit it. So probably during the Q&A, we can also talk a bit about this. But what we see already, when you look at the three discourses from kind of a, like if you take a step back, you see that some change is already implied in each of the three discourses. So the business as usual per se is not uh, defended in any of the discourses, even the, the one, the Lekker van Bayon's discourse between brackets that goes back uh, to the status quo, um, yeah, which is the discourse that goes back and the, the most to the status quo. Um, what is interesting here is that some arguments, I think, or, and we base ourselves on the paper from Lam et al. Uh, from 2020, which is basically, it's called Discourses of Climate Delay. It's about the strategies that are there that delay climate action. Um, and if you take that paper as a starting point and you look at this analysis, you see that some arguments uh, return and some strategies return also in the argumentation that we find uh, within these discourses. And I would think that um, it's not only about delaying climate action, it's also about the way in which debate is being, uh, is being uh, followed through, it's, it's, it's being, is being handled. And you see that um, some arguments, like for example, uh, in the Lekker van Bayon's discourse, um, that say that critical voices are biased and they are uninformed, uh, or arguments like that that create some kind of naturalistic truth, like international markets that determine the rules. So if we do more here, then production will just shift elsewhere and we're just uh, basically engaging in a zero sun operation. So these kinds of arguments, um, I think they narrow the scope for debate because they try to once again depoliticize it, the, 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 the problem at hand. They try to create uh, the idea that there is a right position in this, that there is a right position, that other positions in the debate are naive, are unjustified, and should therefore not be taken seriously. So I think that starting from this kind of analysis, we can really delve into the quality, if you will, of a democratic debate to look at, okay, which argumentation is constructive, if you will, and which arguments are slowing down the debate and are narrowing the scope for debate or are trying to make this issue less political than it actually is. Um, but then to end on a more positive note, um, we also see that discourses may differ on first sight, so based, their, their basic arg argumentation might be uh, different, but then if you look at the norm normative positioning, so the worldviews that are underneath, we see that sometimes uh, they may share uh, certain things. For example, uh, the centrality of the farmer between uh, the Lekker van Bayon's discourse and the agroecological agro discourse. These are the kinds of things that overlap and these are, can be starting points uh, for more inclusive communication. And this is something that we would like to explore also in further steps uh, for this study. Okay, so the final slide with some conclusions. Um, I can be very brief here because we have explained these four points uh, in the theoretical part, as well as uh, by Frederick with the two illustrations. Uh, but we hope you have remembered that climate change issues always come with, with wickedness, uh, with controversy, and that these controversies are always political. Uh, actors always approach a climate issue from a specific scope, from specific assumptions, worldviews, interests, certain facts, and from norms and values. And as such, we are 
confronted with different positions and perspectives. And therefore, we think is a discourse analysis is, is a very useful tool for mapping those uh, different positions and perspectives within a controversy. And it helps to understand the controversy. It helps to understand the production and reproduction of a dominant discourse. And like Frederick just mentioned, the, the, the whole idea of depoliticization. It helps to understand the impact of counter discourses and so on. And at the moment, uh, and coordinated by the King uh, Baldwin Foundation, we are discussing the, the, the possibilities of experiments, uh, for instance, within educational settings and also maybe within uh, media. And then in each case, uh, the main objective is, is then to examine how discourse analysis can lead to a greater awareness uh, and a greater understanding of our own discourse, uh, what, what are our concerns that we bring to the forefront, what are our, our own blind spots. And of course, it's also important to, to create an understanding of the discourses of others. And the question then is, and it's already mentioned by Frederick, does this contribute to inclusive uh, climate communication? And may, maybe the last remark of Frederick, it, maybe it has, to, there's an important uh, opportunity on the layer of worldviews uh, to, to stimulate a uh, the inclusive climate communication. And so we really hope that um, all research on climate controversies uh, can strengthen the, the democratic debate on, on, on the fundamental choices we are facing, and namely, um, what type of society do we want to sustain? And I think that's a nice uh, question uh, to end our presentation. Thank you.